climate, climate change, it's the big topic today and sometimes it seems like some nebulous future tense. However, it's a daily issue that indeed does pop up every day. For instance, 2015 has been the warmest year uh, since the beginning of the recording. Actually, it's the fifth year in a row that it has set a record. It's a very questionable record indeed. Uh, 2015 has also seen uh, the strongest storm in the Western Hemisphere, Patricia. Um, we've had floods. We're still dealing with a very severe drought in California. Um, effects are visible if they can be directly uh, related to climate change. And that's what we want to talk about. And it's especially current today since we all know yesterday um, the World Climate Summit in Paris started. And uh, not only behind me, the Christmas tree is green, also the Eiffel Tower in Paris is lit green. Uh, I, I think I found that very interesting and very <laughs> funny. Um, and today we want to shift the focus from maybe a global view to, to a European one. And um, in our Citizens' Corner debate um, by the European radio network Euronet Plus, we want to talk about how climate change affects us in our daily lives. I'm Ulrike Drevenstedt and I'm very pleased to welcome my guests for this debate. Uh, I'll start with the lady to my left, uh, Kathleen van Bremt, um, Vice Chair of the Group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. Thank you very much for coming. Thank and you. Um, you said, and we'll talk about that later too, that in terms of growth and sustainability, the EU has delivered quite well. We'll, we'll see about that. Yeah, absolutely. Later. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ian Duncan, thank you for coming also, uh, member of the European Conservatives and uh, Reformist Group. And um, I saw a Twitter post you posted, I think, yesterday, um, and you quoted Prince Charles, who said that uh, we are becoming the architects of our own destruction. Yes, he did say that. He was quite, yeah. a, quite a radical speech given by a future king. Yeah, and um, I'm going to ask you later again uh, why you posted that. I, f I found that very interesting. Um, to my left if this <laughs> Javor Benedek, um, uh, you're a member of the group of the Greens, the European Free Alliance. Thank you for being here. And um, you once said in before the summit started that you risks being a bystander at the summit. Yeah, I do. Um, council conclusions of uh, 2014 clearly shows that the EU is losing its momentum uh, of being um, a forerunner of climate negotiations and I think that it's, a, it's, it's, it's really a time and it's a great goal and target and work for European decision makers to come back to the top of uh, climate negotiations. We will talk about that. I think we'll have different opinions on that. Maybe not. We will see. Um, thank you also for being here. Jean-Francois Faconnier. <laughs> Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> um, you're the Climate and Energy Policy Coordinator at CAN, the uh, Climate Action Network, which is an umbrella group of approximately 900 uh, env environmental NGOs worldwide. Yes, worldwide. 113 um, Europe. Even better. Uh, and I know you asked, or you asked um, why the important and central binding national targets are not maintained after 2020. And uh, that is going to be something we'll get into. We'll uh, explain what's that all about and uh, should be very interesting. Um, to my left again, uh, we have Tom von Ireland, acting head of uh, the unit Climas. You're uh, responsible, responsible for strategy and economic, as economic assessment, I'm sorry. Uh, and I know that the whole unit is uh, committed to making Europe the most climate friendly region in the world. Correct. Yeah, that's a very big goal, and uh, how we can reach that, we'll talk about. And last but not least, we have a student in our round. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Robert Salcic, you're from Croatia, and you work for radio student Zagreb. Exactly. Perfect. Um, my very first question to all of you, and uh, whoever wants to answer, uh, aside from being a member of parliament, um, how does climate change affect you, or what are experiences you have made concerning that topic. Do you want to maybe start? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think how it affects me, it's uh, like any other citizen um, in, uh, in Europe, uh, on the one hand, you do notice, you start to notice that things are changing um, within the climate, but it's also very much related to other uh, sustainable and environmental issues. Uh, when I walk my kid to school, she's eight years old, um, if I'm able to walk her to school <laughs> as often as possible. Um, uh, she always complains about um, uh, the air quality, which is not 
discussing the air quality, but she says, it smells, Mama. It's not nice. It's, uh, um, so how we deal with our transport system, how do we deal with um, uh, our economical system, um, everything is very interli interlinked. And that is also very positive news. You can look at it from a very dark side, but you can look at it as um, a very big opportunity. Tackling climate change um, is also about getting a better uh, living standard and living conditions. Um, up until now, people tend to think if we tackle climate change, we will have worse living conditions. Our life will get worse. We will not be able to drive a car. Um, we will have less money because we need to spend it on uh, um, uh, mitigation and adaptation, things like that. Uh, but that's not true. If we combine um, uh, the real sustainable answers to end climate change and uh, um, things that has to do with other envir environmental issues, but also our living quality. Yeah? What do people need in their cities? Is more green, more public space? You can all interconnect and um, there's a solution that is one solution that is a sustainable one that uh, combines everything together. So I, can, I, I tend to see it in a rather positive way. I think we have a problem with our living conditions today that is connected to climate change, but is much more connected to other issues such as pollution and the lack of, of, of of, of public and green spaces in our environment, um, that can be combined together. So I'm quite optimistic. Um, of course, Paris is extremely important, um, and we all, I think everybody around the table, hope for a very good result. Um, but it's not only just a global agreement, it's about a very local action that we need to take. So is everybody else just as optimistic, Mr. Fauconnier? I am relatively optimistic, but I was more p pessimistic a few years back because all of, of all the countries that have submitted their plans, even though when you add all the contribution of, uh, of the different countries, you're not as far as we need to be, and, and we're still going towards a, a climate catastrophe. But the, the mere fact that so many countries have produced plans is quite encouraging, I think. So I'm <coughs> optimistic, but it's only day two. Uh, in Paris, and we'll see what happens at the end of the two-week negotiation. But I think we're on in a very special position and privileged position in a way because we are the first generation, and by generation I'm including students and all the people alike, but we are the first generation to witness the first signs of climate change. And this is only a, s uh, a fraction of what's going to happen if we don't tackle climate change. But we are also the last generation that can really do something about it and make a big change. Because if we wait another 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it will be too late. So I think we, uh, things need to happen now. But when you say we're experiencing it, I hear a lot of people who say, well, you know, it's getting warmer. That's great. I don't have to pay as much money for my, you know, uh, he heating or, uh, you know, it's great because it's warmer. Uh, vacations are great. There's another way to look at that. I used to work in fisheries. Um, cod, in serious trouble in the North Sea, cod is a temperature sensitive spawner. And people would never admit but the reality is that the warming seas have had a huge impact upon the distribution, the success of spawning of a whole range of species. And again, the water is where you sometimes experience this uh, much sooner. You're also seeing again appearing in European waters far more exotic fish than have ever been found before. So we're beginning to experience the change. The reality is it's happening around us. The test for us is how then we adapt how we change and how we mitigate. And I think as we're moving forward now, the challenge for the rest of the globe is how do we balance out where we are uh, in the developed Western world, which has broadly caused the problem? How do we address this challenge whilst also recognizing the rest of the developing world, which wishes to develop, uh, has to do so now following a very different path from the one that we blazed and literally blazed? And mm -hmm. that's a challenge for a whole range of those states around the globe. Uh, from India, which sits atop a huge coal resource, uh, right through to Botswana, again, with massive coal resources. How then do we help them plot a different pathway into the future, and one that we ourselves didn't follow at the time? That's, that's a whole topic we're going to get into, mm -hmm. too, hopefully. Um, Robert, I, you have a very good question that's very related to uh, what every country can do, I guess. Yeah, actually, uh, I'd like to address my first question to all the MPCs, MEPs present here, and that is, what can your countries uh, specifically do to aid the environment, but also, also what are the biggest obstacles you face, well, not you personally, but your governments regarding these uh, environmental policies? Well, would you like to start? 
Well, I think that uh, the level of the member states is a, is a crucial one if you talk about European uh, environmental and climate policy. As uh, um, the European Council conclusion on the targets of 40% of, of mitigation and 27-27% uh, of renewable share and, and energy efficiency, well, we can discuss it if it's enough or not. I believe that it's far from being enough and it's far from what uh, the European Union should do. But still, there is a huge question that there are no uh, member state level obligatory uh, shares of those numbers. Which member states will do what? And nobody knows that how will this happen uh, in the European Union? How will uh, translate this European uh, goal of a 40% uh, reduction uh, into member state action. And in this sense, there are huge differences uh, among the member states. And some member states, and unfortunately, I, I have to say that uh, my uh, home country, Hungary, is not really a forerunner of uh, efforts uh, in uh, the climate issue. And uh, what is really needed and what we really miss is political willingness. Uh, political willingness, which is clearly needed for, uh, for member state action and also uh, European action. Nowadays we see that while some uh, global players and uh, member state players understanding the importance of climate change, which is not only an environmental problem, but if we experience it daily like uh, climate refugees and uh, also the Syrian crisis is partly caused by uh, climate issues, so uh, we shouldn't reduce it to an environmental problem because it, it uh, turns upside down the whole world we know it uh, uh, at the time. But those who are not understanding the systemic uh, nature of, of uh, climate problems which affects our societies, our uh, economies, they regard it as uh, Kathleen already mentioned that uh, well this is something we should spend some money and we try to, uh, to hide ourselves away from, uh, from uh, spending this money but this is clearly a bad solution because it's, uh, uh, it creates or it generates a, a huge uh, problem not only on the environmental level but on, on the economic and the social level and on the other hand the green solutions I believe and this is my deepest conviction green solution green economy is uh, the basis of a competitive working society and economy for the for the future so those who are missing this opportunity they are missing the future Mr. Van Ireland yeah to come back on the question I mean what what, what limits our actions in a way I mean uh, and also on your question on what does it mean for your personal life. Uh, what I think is striking is that in the last 15 years we've seen a drastic change on the perception of what one can do. Uh, only a few years ago I think people were still asking the question, can we reduce? And actually in Europe we have managed to reduce quite reasonable. Uh, but we will have to continue to reduce a lot. Um, in Europe we have developed a vision for 2050 to reduce emissions by at least 80%. And I think people see that that's an option we can reach. So I think that's where a lot has changed. As consumers these days, we have choices. We are informed about choices. We know when we build a house, we can insulate it. And the better we do it, the better it is for climate. So I think one can look at what happened over time as a positive thing. But more needs to be done. Uh, it was said that there will be no targets after 2020. At least for climate change itself, that's not the case. In Europe, we still have a task ahead. We agreed that we would reduce emissions by 2030 by at least 40 percent. Uh, we've already uh, indicated what that would mean for uh, well the split between the sectors covered under our emission trading system and uh, the sectors outside but for the sectors outside we will still have to define national targets between member states and I think there in Europe we will have to look how to do that. We have already indications to the European Council and one of the elements there is that we have to look at the capacity. We are a Europe with quite big differences and we see differences in capacity, but we have done that for the 2020 package and for 2030 we will continue that way. Please. Just to add on, on that, uh, but also going back to the question on, on, on the member states, uh, um, my experience um, at European level and working with the member states is um, member states are more of a problem than a solution. Uh, the, the level of the council and the member states, um, if they start discussing um, the burden sharing, uh, um, they will start discussing you need to do more, you need to do more um, and I want to do less. Uh, that's, the, that's a little bit the atmosphere, the climate in, uh, at, a, at a member state level. 
sorry to say that. That's why I always say um, I, I strongly believe in the strength of the European level, though not always easy, we try to move ahead. And then I strongly believe in the power of cities and regions to make the difference. Why? Because a mayor of, um, of a city, he will not say, I don't want to do anything because it will cost me money. He knows that at the end he will be tackled, he will be left with the problems. Huh? And I said in the beginning, um, there's a real connection between climate change and other environmental issues and, and, and issues related to the living standards. Um, um, so he, the, the one who wants to solve the problem of air pollution, that is the mayor of any city in, in Europe. And there lies a lot of um, strength to change at the local level. Um, so I strongly believe in that. And if you ask uh, what is the, 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 the easy way, to, the, 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 the more easy way to go, I think that lies within um, renewable energy and energy efficiency. Again, something you can really um, make come true also at a very local level. If you make every school in Europe um, uh, energy efficient, uh, you will not only make sure that you meet some of your climate goals, you will make sure that you spend as a local authority less on the bills of your energy and your schools will become better. So um, let's try and find, and there are solutions um, very much um, in front of us. What is the most difficult um, to, to, to tackle but very urgent is everything that is related to transport and, and, and mobility. Uh, we are so related and connected to our car. Um, we distribute all our goods in Europe uh, mainly on trucks instead of other, um, uh, other sustainable um, ways of transport. And although we all know there's very important part of the solution, also again in how to make our cities livable and, and, and our... Um, uh, but I have to say, also in my political party, you, the moment you start talking about uh, pr pricing um, of cars, uh, um, uh, then you, <gasps> is that social? Is that um, so? There we have still a way to go. So, but let's 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 start a discussion. Um, I've been to Stockholm, for instance, a wonderful city, um, and they introduced um, the pricing of cars coming into the city, uh, the, as in London. Uh, I think only Stockholm and London already have that. Um, it's a very difficult political decision to take, but once you've taken it, everybody's in favour. Well, at least in, in Stockholm, uh, Stockholm today, there's a large majority in favour, because at the end of the line, there are less cars, it's, it's the, the, the air is more clean, and the people, they use um, alternatives, and it's good for the health. It's the biking city of Europe. Um. So what, what you're saying is that we should start at the regional level, at the no, local level? Both. No, no, let, no, we also. need both. Also? We need a very strong Europe that puts and states very general goals. Where are we heading at? What are our obligations? Um, tomorrow the, the Commission will come up with um, a package on circular economy. Very important. The goals. Where are we heading at? But Set then the I goals. believe, but then, and I know we I cannot eradicate um, the Council and the mm. Member States, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> uh, but mm. we have to deal with them and try to convince them. And, and But the real change will be then locally. Right, but that's, from my point of view, it's a chain, or it's a, it's a part of the whole chain. And uh, Mr. Javor, you mentioned it. Um, how do we, since that's only a chain in the, or a part of the chain in the whole system, we need to get or, or invent or maybe reinvent um, measures on how to follow up with that. And you said we need mechanisms that, that control maybe um, the progress we're making. And um, my question is, what could these mechanisms be? How do we follow or how do we control, how do we observe, how do we monitor what states do and what, what regions do? Is there a possibility? I think we're, we're being a little bit preemptive, and I am remarkably positive of what will emerge from, from Paris. But we have to be honest with people as well. When we talk about the member state, Great Britain just now has a significant number of people living in energy poverty. And those are people who spend a significant share of their income on keeping warm or in keeping their lights on. What we're about to do going forward will make that more difficult, no matter which route we pursue. That will be a greater cost upon them more people will almost certainly fall into energy poverty. But that's, that's a problem. problem. That is a problem. Now, you say in the longer term that might not be true, and indeed in the longer term it may not be true, but just now, for example, most of the homes in Scotland are um, heated by gas. So if we are to convert those to electricity, which ultimately we would have to do if we're moving in that particular direction, that would mean that every household would have to invest significantly in converting. 
and each bill will be higher because at present the bills are higher for electricity. How do you sell that to people? Well, this is why it becomes difficult because it's very easy at a European level to talk about these things and then say that the member states are not pulling their weight. But the member states, the governments have got to get re-elected. That's how democracy works. So the challenge then is how do you ensure that the people move in their direction, which must be moved in, while also recognizing the challenges they face in doing so. I mean, for example, Scotland, my constituency, uh, is one of the most progressive when it comes to electric cars. There are 2,000 electric cars in Scotland out of a fleet of 3.2 million cars. When we talk about alternatives, again, uh, the railway lines don't go everywhere in Scotland. It's got islands. How do we then ensure that people are able to go about their daily business? And again, if we want people to move toward electric cars, that's fine. But the electric grid itself doesn't allow them to travel most of the distance up the land. So there are challenges ahead, each of them carrying a cost. Now, they can be met. They can, of course, be met. But the point is, we have to be realistic when we're talking about the role of governments here, because governments are ultimately the people who have to deliver this and fund it and set the taxes that will make it happen. That's the challenge. I think it's, it's, it's a, a, a wrong way of approach because um, basically uh, what we need, and let's go back to the issue of energy poverty. There is a lot of discussion that why renewables are, are too expensive for, for poor, poor people. But uh, if there are uh, proper member state and European programs, for example, for energy efficiency, uh, this is the cheapest way uh, to uh, decrease uh, the energy bills of the households and that's the direction we, we should go uh, the people doesn't need cheap energy they need low energy bills and if we can help them to consume less energy that's the way uh, how we can uh, provide them uh, low energy bills on the long run and that's that's a problem because uh, when we talk about energy efficiency there is a lot of talks on the European and member states level on, on energy efficiency um, and, and we talk and talk and talk but when we come to uh, direct, uh, direct programs and uh, European spendings, how we spend uh, the EU funds, when we talk about the European energy security strategy and uh, um, the PCI list, which is the, the projects of uh, common interest, uh, always we bump into a phenomenon which says that we talk a lot about energy efficiency, but we spend on fossil and we spend on nuclear and we spend on traditional energy systems. That should be uh, changed uh, to, to provide uh, the people low energy bills in a sustainable way to consume less energy and uh, to help them to have access to renewable solutions which on the long run and sometimes even right now in the case of solar energy uh, they are competitive uh, with um, fossil or nuclear energy um, if we take into consideration also uh, uh, those costs which are not included in the price of fossil and nuclear energy right now in Europe, and there was uh, the scandal of uh, Günther Oettinger when uh, uh, in the, uh, the previous commission they tried to hide um, a report, a study which clearly proved that in Europe we spend as much to fossil subsidies and to nuclear subsidies than on renewable subsidies. And if we take into consideration all that, we can say that uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency are competitive. This is not the question of uh, energy poverty or the, um, uh, uh, the consumer possibility of, of the households, but this is a, a question of uh, political willingness from the member states and uh, in the European uh, institutions. And this is what we should change, and I believe that the member states, of course Europe is going to the direction of integration, but member states right now have uh, a crucial role in European decision making. So we cannot make accepted anything which are not agreed by the member states. So that's um, a very special level where we have to act. So that leads back to mechanisms we'll talk about, but Mr. Fauconnier has been waving. He's yeah. something really urgent to say. Now to add to what Benedek uh, uh, Javor just said, uh, I think half of the solution is to, uh, for houses is to lower the energy demand through insulation and so on, and governments certainly have a role to play. And the other half is to produce in energy in a cheap and sustainable way. 
and Mr. Duncan to example of uh, his homeland Scotland and that's a brilliant example because Scotland has got the target of producing 100% of its electricity with renewables I think it's by 2030. Except it's failing those targets and it's going to have to import its electricity from England because it doesn't have the generation capacity anymore. That's the problem Scotland faces. Well it's on its way to 100% and the only problem, it, no, the only, problem if is it, only if it imports the electricity the problem it's got right now is by closing down its thermal power stations it will enter into energy deficit. No, that's the problem sorry, Scotland the problem, faces right the now. The problem now is the policy in London that's going to no, cut all the no, subsidies no, for all I, the again, renewables. I that's fundamentally what's going to make no, I fundamentally oh. disagree with that. Right now in Scotland we have thermal power stations. They are going to be closed down. What we're left with, again, the nuclear power stations will also close. At that point, we're approaching just now and making about half the electricity, renewable electricity. But the reality is we are dependent upon gas because most households are heated with gas. And the point I made a moment ago about the cost-neutral aspect of this is we're talking about this only as if it's energy generation. Think about cars. There is no cost-neutral approach to that. The car you have now is over. You need a new car, and it's going to have to be electric. If it's going to be an electric car, that has a cost. And bearing in mind, in my constituency alone, there are islands. So how on earth are you going to make sure the grid itself works if you have to plug your car in? That is going to be a substantial cost if we're going to move in that direction. And as Kathleen said earlier, the air quality itself is often directly affected by transport. So if you're in a city, it's usually the transport question that causes you the problem. And if we're really going to be honest about this and we're going to convert our fleets, that is a huge cost. And okay. we have to be honest about that with people because if we are politicians and we pretend it's all cost neutral and it's all fine, we're going to have a problem. We, we invest a lot of money into yeah, energy, energy systems. So it's not a question that not investing in, in energy or investing. Or we're talking or about cars. Investing. How do well, we do that? How do we get to the situation where the cars themselves I believe are that not uh, within, yeah, within, ten, within 10 years there will be the, uh, the, the cars uh, most of the people are having right now, they will be changed within the next 10, ten most years. most people buy second-hand so let's, hab let's help them uh, to get access to uh, to sustainable transport and instead of cars, in cities at least, okay, the islands are a different issue, but in, in, in cities to, uh, to move to, uh, to public transport issues. But in uh, energy system, uh, the question is not to invest in renewable energy systems and energy efficiency or not investing to anywhere, but the question is that where we invested huge amount of money, which we are going to invest in uh, energy markets and energy infrastructure. In, in the, the United Kingdom, you are going to invest a huge amount of money in new nuclear power plant, which will uh, produce uh, electricity on the double uh, price than the, the market price right now. But so you are, you are be, spending... Presumably you are, that will be carbon you are, neutral, though. There will be no emissions spending, from that. But so this is, this there is will the be price. no emissions. This is the price. You are spending a lot of but money if you're on talking about emissions and should, zero emissions, isn't uh, that therefore a good nuclear thing? Nuclear is not zero emission, but if you, well, if you uh, imp, uh, invest here. that money into renewable energy and energy efficiency measures, you are at the same place for half of the money. Well, except, the of course, right now in Scotland, when the wind doesn't blow, you have to basically bring it in from thermal. Now, the point well, is... If Scotland were Great to embrace regulation is an important we're issue. facing Stop. here short term versus long term <laughs> yeah. problems. And I also guess. The, the, of course, um, Ian is right. We're not going to solve the problem the next five years. Yeah. That's the problem. We need to uh, let's take term. let's take the the horizon of 2050. But the one thing we have to do um, is be be do that in a consequent way, and that's the problem. Of course, uh, we've been discussing um, the renewable energy. Everybody can understand that renewable energy, the wind and the sun, is more cheap than taking out the oil or fracking oil or whatever out of the ground um, and then put it in, um, in installations. Everybody knows that at the end of the, end of the line, renewable will always be cheaper. The problem is that we have to convert our system. That sense, Ian is right. It's the way but there. Yes, but Bear in mind, and that's what people who defend the fossil fuel always forget, it's two things. First of all, as has been said, but I want to repeat it, because it's extremely important, today we subsidize three times more the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry than, than the renewables. Everybody tends to think that we're only subsidizing renewable. That's not true. Eh? So that's not really a very good way of making policy if we want to head to 100% renewable and our, our, climate, our uh, climate goals. Um, and the second reason, um, now I forgot. Um, the Do you think about oh it? Yeah, no, no, the very important. The second reason is we need to convert our system. We need to convert it anyway. 
the energy system in Europe is old. It needs to be renewed. And then you can take the direction of going instantly to the 100% renewable as, a, as the goal in 2050. Yeah? And doing every, everything that you have to renew in that direction or still keep on investing in an energy system that sustains fossil fuels. So and the Commission has, um, and but can maybe perhaps explain better, um, in the formal legislate later the Commission um, made a report on that and they came up to the conclusion that um, anyway the best solution is to go for energy efficiency, 100% renewable and make sure that um, you have the system underlying that to, to, to make sure that, that it can happen. So it's what we need to do, we can, we can argue Scotland and things that are now the case, but let's look at the long term and make the, all the decisions in that sense. And then I think we're, we can achieve our goals. The problem is that, that I think the, the, the problem is that the, the long term vision is right, let's say. You mentioned uh, the European goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. It's between 80 and 95%. I think the goal is right, but the problem is that the current ambition is not matching the long-term goal. It's like, if, if I may take an analogy for the people who like to run, it's like if you want to run a marathon in less than four hours, let's say, and you start walking, it's not thinking work. that in the last kilometers you will sprint and catch up. You will never do that. I mean, you have that to, your, your speed is to be adapted to mm -hmm. your long-term goal. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it's not the case. I think that the, the ambition uh, for greenhouse gas, for renewables, certainly, for energy efficiency, the one for 2020 and the one for 2030 is not up to the ambition in the long term. And it's not up to the European responsibility to play its part in Mr. the fight Van against Ireland, climate change. Do you change. agree? No, not on that <laughs> last one. Uh, I think what we said is that we want to reduce by 20% a decade. And I mean, on that rhythm, we will be uh, on uh, the level where we have to be by um, 2050. A um, few reflections on what we heard. Uh, the issue, of course, is often that uh, maybe over time it's not that more expensive, but early on in the, in the process it can be more expensive. And that's what we pointed out by, by saying very clearly that we have an investment issue here. Many of the measures are more expensive when you invest in them, but they save energy over time. And of course, saving energy leads to the reducing greenhouse gas em emissions. So I think many policies will need to focus on how we can uh, tackle the investment hurdle, at least at the EU level. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, many of our budgets foresee uh, the help in, for instance, uh, investing in energy efficiency, the structural funds, uh, the, the recent Juncker fund, uh, but also now uh, measures that we have, into, I mean, uh, have proposed under the context of the, the ETS have the aim of trying to help um, certain people who want to invest in energy efficiency, for instance, by taking that hurdle, noting that over time uh, you save the benefits. Another element is, and I think electric cars was mentioned, uh, we don't need all tomorrow to drive electric cars, but over time we will need to find a solution to get there. And we also know that over time, uh, the more these kind of cars are on the streets, the cheaper the technology gets. So it's also a, an issue indeed of transition, of putting policies in place where you pull and push these technologies through, but where you can ensure over time that costs reduce of the technologies. So what is a concrete way? What can we tell the citizens today? What can we do today to stop climate change? I'm not able or, or I can't afford to buy an electric car tomorrow. And many people can't either. No, but when you go... But what are we going to do today? Because as everybody agrees, I think, we need to start working now, don't we? But I think the question isn't... You cannot individualize that. Because uh, some people live in the city, some live um, uh, in the countryside. People who live in the city, cities today, um, in a lot of cities in Europe, do have an alternative for their car. Public and, transportation. And public transportation, other means of transportation. If you do not live in the city, but you live um, on the countryside, you don't have that alternative. Huh? Correct. But we know um, that in due time, 80% of the people will live in cities what's in Europe as well. Due what's time what's by 2030, 2050. That's mm -hmm. the, the people. Th that's the move. We're moving into 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 the cities. Um, so if you, you politics is about priorities. Uh, we cannot save all the problems right now in all of Europe, uh, let, let alone the world. We uh, wish. But, um, <laughs> uh, but you need to prioritize your solutions today 
um, at the city level. Why do I keep on repeating that? Because I know the solutions are over there. Hmm? Um, uh, I think we need to prioritize uh, what we do on energy efficiency. We need to prioritize um, what we do on uh, renewables. And in that sense, it's not about individual responsibility, or although everybody can help, um, but it's about collective responsibility at a collective level. Um, so I think um, that's, that's a very, a very um, uh, important issue. If you start blaming people for not living the right life, I think we did that um, in the past. It's not helping um, anyway the course we need to take. So then if we want to shift the focus back to um, the, uh, the summit in Paris right now, Robert, I know you have uh, a very good question that uh, kind of concludes. Uh, regarding the Paris summit. Well, yeah, um, China and the US actually are the top two polluters in the world. And uh, both of these states are in the past proved to be reluctant when it comes to uh, when it comes to reducing their carbon uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, 2009 Copenhagen summit was obviously a failure because um, we have a lot of conflicted interests. So, do you believe? I, I believe you, Sir Duncan, said that uh, you are optimistic about this uh, conference. Do you believe that um, this failure of 2009 could happen again? And if not, why not? What has changed in the meantime? Well, there are probably two simple answers. In the U.S. context, um, fracking has happened. The embracing of gas has allowed the U.S. to substantially reduce its carbon emissions. Uh, President Obama talks about the gas bridge, the bridge to the next generation to allow time again to invest in renewables. I think that has happened. I think in China, we're witnessing the tortuous quality of air that they suffer. I think that's driven a massive change in the mentality of the Chinese government probably less so than the emissions question, more about the air quality question. So those two things, I think, have changed. I think also against that backdrop, there is a recognition that the technologies which we need to move forward are there. We've just got to make sure that they are deployed in a way that makes, makes them cost efficient and cost effective. So I think there is a significant change in the mood since Copenhagen. But equally, I think there will remain a number of challenges, not least of which is the funding question for those who have to deal with the consequences. And I'm not yet comfortable that that has yet been resolved because people talk about money and offer money and then don't really deliver the money. And I think, in truth, that's the big, the big pain for the rest of the world is the global uh, promise, never the global reality. And we are going to struggle, I think, unless those developing nations are funded through the significant changes they will have to embrace. And I'm not yet comfortable that that's going to be on the table. So we have experienced that promises aren't met, as you mentioned. Um, in general, we have only a couple of minutes left, unfortunately, and there are so many topics we wanted to talk about. But in general, do you put hopes on the Paris summit that uh, it is going to help us in maybe stopping or preventing climate change? Um, Mr. Van Ireland? Well, okay, it's phrased in a different way, but... Uh, Ian just said it. I think Paris is a, is, a, is a very important COP if you see that 168 countries already have put on the table their actions. I mean, we see true global action now. Is it good enough to be at two degrees? No. Um, we have indicated as the EU that we want to make sure there's a review system in there, that we regularly can talk to each other to see how can we improve. But if you would compare the kind of projections we do today to what we did 10 years ago, 10 years ago it's a major difference. So yes, I would say Paris has clearly a positive outback there. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree on that. Um, uh, let's make it a success. Uh, um, optimism is a moral duty, especially when you're in politics. I, I, uh, but I agree with Ian, one of the most difficult things is the financing, uh, and very crucial one. Uh, we talked uh, um, energy poverty. Well, if you talk about energy poverty, there's a big issue in, um, in Africa, for instance, where a lot of people don't even have access to um, electricity. Um, uh, when we put the finance in place and we make the right priorities, we can make sure that the people in Africa, instead of moving through fossil fuels to get their electricity, make sure that we just Skip that. Skip that and just go for once in the right direction. But then we need a lot of money to, be, to, to make that happen. Let's do that. It's good for the people in Africa. That's their right. It's good for, um, for the global climate. Um, and uh, it's good also for our uh, responsibility that we have, our historical responsibility that we need to take up. So can we conclude that we're all optimistic about the Paris summit? 
Yeah, I, I think wha what is important to take into consideration that we won't solve the problem in, in, in Paris. So who expects from Paris that it solves all the climate issues, um, they will be disappointed. What we need in Paris is to set up the right frame uh, for further uh, climate policy making and also to include mechanisms uh, to from time to time in every five years to, to check and control if we are on the right track or not and if it's needed we can uh, speed up uh, our efforts uh, in, in climate policy. In this sense I'm optimistic. I believe that uh, we are able and there is a political willingness to make this uh, deal uh, in Paris but uh, what is very important to see that what will happen after Paris in, uh, with participation of uh, the parties, including China, where we have a, a, a booming uh, renewable energy market, and with the participation of the US, and with the participation of the European Union, we have to be forerunners of uh, further uh, climate efforts. So a very short last comment. Very short. Well, I would say that this radio program is like Paris. Time is really running out, but we have a few seconds left that hopefully in Paris we can make it. Well, that sounds like a very, very good uh, closing word. Um, Kalin van Brem just said, let's make it a success. Let's hope it will be. But let's not forget that after Paris, there's still a lot to do, um, as has been mentioned before. Um, us getting together may have been um, a step in the right direction. Um, let's hope so and let's keep on working at making Paris a success and stopping climate change. Thank you all very much for joining and discussing with me today. Thank you very much.